Welcome back everybody. Strap in, this is gonna be a long one. Today we're gonna to be doing a comparison between aircraft maintenance on the line and aircraft maintenance at the hangar. Let's begin with the line. This is where you see me most of the time. Primary responsibilities on a line maintenance technician is mostly preventative maintenance, performing thorough walk arounds and starting up aircraft for the first flights of the day, as well as maintaining departing the aircraft. Observation and attention to detail is key because aircraft do come in and out consistently, keeping an eye out for bird strike, lightning strikes, or any kind of damage. Making sure all the oils are topped off and serviced because these aircraft are flying non-stop. Doing GVIs, general visual inspections, upon arrival. Walk rounds inside wheel wells, depending on the aircraft you're working on. Making sure there's no discrepancies and no damage and no leakage. Also, servicing any kind of hydraulic fluid that is needed. As I've mentioned before, aircraft do seep out fluid time to time. This is due to pressure and temperature. Usually debriefing the pilots as they arrive. We want to make sure there are no in-flight discrepancies in the flight deck or in the cabin. Going over all the parameters, making sure the aircraft is airworthy. This includes checking the interior of the aircraft, making sure all the lights and bells and whistles are working properly, basically. And time to time, aircraft do come in with some issues. Remember, uh, most of these modern jets are computerized and yeah. Guess what? Computers do fault time to time, and it's our responsibility as maintenance to clear these faults. We use proper documentation, which is the aircraft maintenance manuals, and the TSMs, the troubleshooting manuals, or FIM, Boeing likes to call it, and we make sure the aircraft is serviceable. Any kind of LRU, line replaceable units, will be fixed or replaced, whether it be a computer box or a simple light bulb. Aircraft maintenance is responsible for the whole aircraft, not just portions of it. Now I'm speaking on my own half because in the United States I follow the FAA guidelines which is the AMP certificate, airframe and power plant. On top of which the respective company that provides the type certification of particular aircraft. That makes us basically responsible for the whole thing. As I always say jokingly, toilets to tires ladies and gentlemen, toilets to tires. We do it all, we fix it all. Performing operational checks and functional checks is necessity when aircraft do come in with problems even going down to as far as replacing brakes and wheels and tires. We do the walk around to pay attention for these kind of things. If we see a discrepancy, we will document it in a logbook and address the situation. Same goes for aircraft, as I mentioned earlier, that come in with discrepancies that are pilot write-ups or cabin write-ups. Also, some aircraft fly extended over water, ETOPS. This furthers our responsibilities to double check even, even more scrutiny, checking vital components such as very important engine components as well as cargo pits. It's an ongoing process and it's very fast paced, especially on the line. Please take in consideration when I say line maintenance, I am referring to strictly a day shift and swing shift line maintenance. There's also such thing as night shift line maintenance. They have a little bit more ground time and they can perform a little bit more duties. But when it comes to dispatching aircraft on a live turn, lots of things can go uh, weary, I could say. Small little items like this, such as a tray table or anything like emergency equipment that needs to be replaced defibrillators, oxygen bottles. This all falls under line maintenance. We try to double check and triple check everything as much as possible. Some of these aircraft don't have very much ground time. Most airplanes come in and go out within 20 to 40 minutes. Any kind of discrepancies that come in, we try to fix anything that's negligible or can be deferred via NEF, MEL programs will be deferred and that's legal. But trust me, that will never ever compromise the safety of flight. Another small responsibility here, changing out oxygen bottles for the crew. This is according to ETOPS limits or just in general limits of allowing the aircraft to be dispatched airworthy. On top of that, the best part of the job is usually taxiing these aircraft. Time to time, we as aircraft maintenance do have to reposition aircraft from the hangar to the line, from the line to the hangar. So it's always a fun thing to drive airplanes around. Technicians are qualified and certified to be high power run as well as tow and taxi on the respective fleets. Like I said, this is probably my favorite part of the job. Get to drive a multi-million dollar piece of equipment. Yeah, definitely lots of fun. All in all, that's what we do at the line. Routine and non-routine maintenance and preventative maintenance. Now let's focus on the hangar. Hangar maintenance is a completely different animal. The aircraft has lots of ground time, whether it be a station hangar environment or a heavy base environment. This is the Oklahoma facility. This is one of the largest aircraft maintenance bases and overhaul shops. Aircraft literally gets stripped apart and put back together. 
So you ask yourself, what is a maintenance check? Well, it's subdivided into primarily four different kinds. A checks, B checks, C checks, and D checks. A check being the most lightest and D check the most heaviest. Now I'm gonna double back on myself here and just briefly explain what a line maintenance check is because that is the most lightest one. Sometimes called a post-flight or a maintenance pre-flight or a service check or overnight. This goes back to what I was saying earlier of line maintenance at a night shift environment. This is where they do these things. So again, line maintenance usually happens every 24 hours to 60 hours of accumulated flight time. Okay, fast forward to A checks. Approximately 400 to 600 flight hours, depending on the aircraft and the manufacturer. Typically done inside of a hangar and usually performed overnight. Now you're gonna see me repeat myself a lot here because redundancy is at its finest when it comes down to these checks. Everything that I talked about within line maintenance checks during the nighttime or daytime gets double checked on an A check. This means fluids on engines, servicing hydraulics, checking emergency lights, equipment, lubrication of the gear, parking brake accumulators, you name it, they look at it. A checks can also be subdivided into phase A checks. If the aircraft does not have enough time on ground, they can subdivide A checks into partitions. That means a full blown A check can be broken up into pieces, which will be referred to as a A1, A2, A3, etc etc same thing can be done with b checks and c checks up next we're going to have a b check b checks have a little bit more scrutiny into them and they are further apart approximately every six to eight months at this point the aircraft now needs a bit more time on ground usually about two to three days at this point everything discussed within the a check gets redone in the b check plus on top of that extra inspections Inspections such as alignment, making sure to inspect the wheel wells thoroughly, making sure all the tubing and there's no corrosion, and any kind of modification that needs to occur. It's almost like an intermediary check, right before the super heavy checks come in, the C checks and the D checks. Now, as I mentioned earlier, C checks can be subdivided into phase checks, partitioned off. But if it's a full blown C check, aircraft is usually down for a one week or two weeks at least. This usually occurs on an interval of between one year to one and a half year, depending on a manufacturer and the limitations. This is where things get really interesting. The examination of structure, load bearing components and fuselage and wings start to get very scrutinized attention, especially for corrosion and damage. Checking operational status of the circuitry and its lifespan, as well as an in-depth lubrication of all fittings and all cables. Remember what I said I was gonna repeat myself? Once again, everything that's done in the C check is the same things that's done in the B check and the A check. So you see how it all stacks up, right? Every single time they do a check, they have to accomplish basically an A check, a B check, and the final check, the C check. So it just keeps adding. But then again, now you understand why the aircraft needs so much ground time. Now let's go to the big boy, the D check. This check usually happens between six to 10 years of the life of the aircraft. So every six to 10 years, again, depending on a manufacturer and its specs, the aircraft will be downed and about a period of four to six weeks, if not longer, and the aircraft will be completely stripped. Everything comes off, the seats, the roof, the, some portions of the skin, panels come down, aircraft is completely scrutinized to its every nut and bolt. These processes can take up to 30,000 to 50,000 of labor hours. Yep, lots of people, a big team of aircraft technicians. On top of that, you have very heavy overhaul facilities that have their own internal overhaul stations. They can redo seats, they can remanufacture their own landing gear and just make it like new. All certified and all approved by the FAA standards. And if you're wondering how much actually this all costs, this we're talking in millions of millions of dollars here. Not only for the aircraft itself, because any kind of faulty or damaged equipment needs to be replaced, but on top of that, you're paying your workers, obviously. Once aircraft are down for a prolonged amount of time, facilities usually take advantage for modifications. Any kind of new update, any kind of new uh, systems or requirements, they will be installed and modified. But as you can see, qualified technicians, pull this whole aircraft apart, everything from engines, thrust reversers, wings, you name it. Everything gets pulled apart. One of the most common things to find is corrosion, obviously. So that's why you see a lot of paneling being removed and resurfaced and repainted. 
It takes great deal of effort and lots of attention to detail when it comes down to these heavy, heavy checks. Not only are the technicians performing their duties, but there's also a double set of eyes. You have such thing called as an RII system, required inspection items. What that means is once the technician is done performing their duty, whether it be fixing, modifying, or repairing, there's another set of eyes, an inspector or a quality assurance that will go back and double check everything. These facilities are very massive. They can house many aircraft, everything from wide body to narrow body. As I mentioned earlier, some of these shops do have overhaul facilities and they can remanufacture landing gear and many other components such as actuators, struts, wheel assemblies, everything. Here's a nice example of a 737-800. It's sitting up on jacks and look what's missing, the whole landing gear, it's been completely removed. The aircraft is placed on jacks, so don't worry if I'm walking underneath it, it's completely safe. It's pretty amazing to see that a aircraft in this condition will be put all back together and will be soaring through the skies with passengers in them. Another fascinating portion of this overhaul facility is that it has its own engine shop. This is where power plant technicians can basically dissect these engines completely apart and make sure everything is working in proper order. Any kind of component that needs to be replaced or remanufactured or overhauled can be done right here at the facility. What you're looking at there are CFM 56 engines. And as you can see, they've been completely disassembled. Technicians will go through the specs, make sure everything is within limits and re-equip the engine right back onto the aircraft. They can go to such extent where they can even zero time the engine. What that means is a complete overhaul of the internals of the engine. Personally, I have worked line environment as well as hangar environment, but it's always amazing to watch these components like this. I usually see it already as an end user. I watch the aircraft come in and go back out, but watching this kind of heavy maintenance, it's always fascinating to me and it's amazing how much work is done to get the aircraft back into service. Another interesting facet is that these facilities also have test cells. Before equipping these engines onto the aircraft itself, they can be put into test cells and ran up to make sure it's performing up to par. Now, a frequent question I always get asked by young technicians or up and coming technicians that want to be part of the aircraft maintenance industry is, which is better? Do I pick line or do I pick hangar? From personal experience, I would always say, go with the hangar. The hangar environment has more facilities and more downtime, which allows the technician to learn at a steady pace. This allows for identification of certain components, understanding where things are located, how to properly troubleshoot, as well as not being in a stressful environment. Once a technician is capable of being comfortable with the aircraft, at that point, I would definitely recommend trying the line, which is more of a fast paced environment. Well, that's about it folks. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Now you know the difference between line maintenance and hangar maintenance. Hope you guys learned something and thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.